very lucky to have Professor Chris Samsarian speaking to us. Um, he's going to talk about mentoring, and then there's going to be a bit of a QA and a session. So I encourage you to, you know, think of some, some good questions to ask Chris. And then we're going to have uh, a panel session with some of our EMCRs. So just a little bit about um, Chris. Chris is the Deputy Director of the Centenary Institute, and he's also the head of the Molecular Cardiology Program at the Institute. So he's a cardiologist with a specific research focus on the genetic basis of cardiovascular diseases. He has an established research program. Um, so it's at the interface of that basic science, clinical research and public health um, with the ultimate goal to prevent the complications of genetic heart diseases in our community. Now he's published over 150 peer reviewed scientific publications in the highest ranking cardiovascular and general medical journals. He's also been the primary supervisor for over 30 PhD honors and medical students since 2003, and is an active member of the mentoring program at the University of Sydney. So I'd like to welcome Chris and invite him up to the stage to give his presentation. Thank you very much, Zoe, and uh, to Jamie for um, his introductory notes. Um, I'm, not the, I'm not the central act today. The, 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 the best act today will be the four early career researchers and mid-career researchers in the panel. I'm just a warm-up act. Um, what I'd like to do in the next 10, 15 minutes is to actually tell you a little bit about some of the sort of things I've learned about mentoring over time. I'm actually really excited today because I think I'm correct in saying it's the first time in over 12 months I've given a talk wearing pants. <laughs> because this has been my photo of the pandemic. This is my son and I, uh, this was in one of the lockdowns. And I'd been in my room for about four hours doing a telehealth clinic and he'd been in his room with his first job as all online. And we ran into each other in the corridor and first, the first thing to say is that uh, genetics works um, in the sense that he, he sort of looks a bit like me, I guess, a uh, young, uh, younger me. Um, but this was our life. This was, um, you know, business up top and, and party down below. Um, so that was our image of the pandemic and, um, you know, it's, it's affected all of us and it'll be great to hear later on in the session today how we can go move forward in, from 2022 onwards in terms of living with COVID and moving on and, and uh, doing great research. So I've got a couple of slides to start with just to go through some of the basics of mentoring. Um, and then I'm going to give you the, my top 10 thoughts about what's so important about mentoring and what your mentor should be telling you. Uh, there has been some rumours on social media that I'll be talking about Taylor Swift in some of my slides. And unfortunately, Susie, I'm very busy and it's a very short period of time, so I'm not sure if I can do that, but I might mention it once or twice. <laughs> um, so a mentor is usually an experienced colleague who supports someone less experienced, advising and guiding on such things as career goals and personal development. The mentor should have a genuine desire, passion and dedication to hold the mentee's best interests at the forefront always and to be one of their role models. I like that little image down the bottom of the mentor and the, you know, the mentee sort of next step of their career, helping them up along the way. The role of your mentor, there's many roles and today's talk is not about going through a dictionary of different things, but these are some of the things that are important. Guidance on career goals, personal development and illuminating career opportunities, promotion to leadership positions like scientific committees and review panels uh, and research bodies, identify potential barriers and challenges to career progression. And this is where particularly, I think women are affected in the sense that they clearly have more barriers uh, than, than men do, and we need to support women strongly. Awareness of research integrity and international opportunities, which I'll come to in one of my top 10 points. You can have two slides like that. It's got lots of dot points about what mentoring is all about. But in my opinion, I mean, the perfect mentor is basically summarized in this slide that mentor needs to be your number one fan. So you need to be on that mentor's mind all the time so that when opportunities arise, when they're at international meetings and they're talking about programming a meeting or a scientific program, they'll say, yes, I remember Jess Orchard, she was great. Uh, put her on the, on the program. It's the little things like that. So you need to infiltrate the mind of the mentor. The second thing is that you need to be able to mentor with somebody or have a mentor who you can sit down and have a coffee with or a beer with or a water with or a soft drink with, where you can actually let go and relax and actually tell people how you really feel about your career. And I think they're two really important things. 
Um, so being the number one fan and being the perfect mentor are two important things. Now, mentorship is a relationship. It's like any relationship we have, uh, uh, personal relationships. It's okay if it doesn't work. If you've had your first mentorship opportunity and after an hour you think, there's no way I'm going to be able to spend another hour with this person, that's okay. You can tell them very politely that, you know, thanks for the efforts, but you know, we might go our separate ways or you can do like they do on first dates and not actually answer any of their calls. Um, or you can go to, of course, the Queen and you can say, we're never ever, ever going to get back together. <laughs> so this is a shot. This is a shot, Susie, for Twitter. <laughs> so if you don't know what to say, we are never, ever, ever going to get back together. Okay, so two of the 10 random things that your mentor should be telling you as an EMCR, and I'll run through these really quickly. Number one, make sure you love what you do. I don't expect people to sleep in their, where they work, like this, this lady is here, but you need to wake up every morning wanting to go to work. If you're in any job, any job, I tell my kids the same thing, they're all young uh, adults. If you're not waking up and wanting to go to work, at least 95% of the time, you need to look for another job. Research is such a tough gig and there's going to be failures and there's going to be miserable times. But if you love what you do and have a passion, it'll be a bit easier. So I really mean that. And, and it's, you know, you're not stuck in research. There's other opportunities if you're not happy with research. And, and uh, just uh, ask yourself, are you happy waking up in the morning, going to work and writing that grant or doing that experiment or looking at the data of the 10,000 people from the UK Biobank? You know, make sure you love what you do. Secondly, apply for everything and NHMRC and beyond. Uh, why do I put the wiggles up there? In, in my desperation many years ago, I look, was looking for places to get funding from and the yellow wiggle, who actually had a cardiac arrest about 12 months ago and survived, but the yellow wiggle many years ago was when he bent down and stood up, he was getting dizzy spells and blackouts. So they started the Yellow Wiggle Foundation. So I applied for it. I mean, I'd never dreamt that I'd be you know, applying for the Yellow Wiggle Foundation that my kids grew up watching. I didn't get the grant, but it just illustrates that you've got to apply for all sorts of things and think a bit left field. My other left field grant was I did get a grant from the Paul Newman Bolognese Source Foundation, which is fantastic. Number three, get used to rejection or rejection is your friend. I want you all to think about in your life, the one researcher who you think is the best, right? Put that in your mind. I guarantee you 100% that person has had more rejections than successes because rejection is part of the nature of research and science and, and funding. And so, you know, with, with schemes like the investigator grant, which is what, 9%, 10%, 90% of people are going to fail. But when I say fail, they're not going to get to that bar. It doesn't mean they're a failure in itself. But so rejection is your friend. Get used to it. Have a little cry. Kick a few doors down when you get the result, when you're upset but charge up the next day and, and start working again. I always tell my students as well that, and, and postdoc fellows that when you write a grant, even if it's not successful, you can then dice it up. Cap, you know, put part of this grant into a Heart Foundation Fellowship, put part of this grant into a Heart Kids grant. So it's not a loss. People think, oh, I didn't get the grant. It's not a waste of time. You can use that information successfully. Um, if you still don't know what to do when you've uh, got rejection, of course, you go to the Queen and you just shake it off. And this is another photo opportunity for you. I put these in all for you, for Susie. I'm not a big fan of Taylor Swift. I've only been to every one of her concerts in Sydney. For my daughters, for my daughters, of course. Okay, number four, map out a plan early. Fellowships, grants, promotions, etc. You can't apply for a fellowship a month out. You need to plan it years in advance. I remember one of my postdocs who got a, a career development award a few years ago, we started planning for her next fellowship the year after she got her four year fellowship. Because you can't build your publication record in six weeks. You can't build your you know, contributions to science in the community in six weeks or eight weeks or 10 weeks or six months. So you've got to think about long term sort of proposals and Benjamin Franklin says, by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. So always be ready and think not just six months ahead, but two years ahead. Where do I want to be in two years? What do I have to do to get to that level in two years time? Number five, publications are your currency. 
And by that, I mean, whether you like it or not, publications are gonna be an important part of your applications. Good quality publications, fair volume of publications. I'm writing my first investigative grant at the moment. Your whole life comes down to 10 publications in the last 10 years. And that accounts for 35% of your application. So over one third. So whether you like it or not, or it's not a fair measure, you need good publications and they are a currency. And I, I boast of showing you this middle paper here, which is a New England paper we published a few years ago. I show that because the outcomes of that has impacted, of course, on families and patients with genetic heart disease and sudden death, but it's been a, uh, a vehicle for a number of grants to be successful, fellowships to be successful, PhD scholarships to be successful. So you get a runoff from these papers, these big papers in terms of um, funding um, success. Number six, international standing is a discriminator. What do I mean by that? So when Jamie and I, or I saw Christos Remedios here, Professor Christos Remedios, when, when we look at you know, applications, let's say a, a fellowship application, we might have 50 applications to look at. You go through it, the bottom 20 are pretty clearly bottom 20. The next 20 up, they're probably okay, but they're not quite there. And then you end up with a top echelon of maybe 10 really good applications and there's only five to be given. So how do you work out amongst those 10? Because when you look at them on paper, those 10 applications, they all look the same. They're all really good. They've all done tick the right boxes. They've done good publications. They've contributed to science. They've reviewed papers. They've done all the right things. So what do we use to discriminate that top 10 people? And I think one important thing is international prominence. So there's some examples here, but you certainly look at those top 10 and you think they're all good nationally, but not all of them are internationally renowned. So things like your mentor should be telling you about giving international talks, as you can see there, being part of international editorial boards, being part of best practice guideline documents if you're a clinician, where you interact with international people around the world. Uh, social media, I mean, we've been joking about it, but it's a great opportunity. I mean, Susie's is a perfect example of how you can leverage interactions across the globe um, through things like Twitter. So to me, and I'm not sure if Jamie is the same and others, but one of the discriminators I use when they're all the same, those top 10 look fantastic, is what puts them a little bit ahead of the other person and international prominence is a big one. Number seven, support women in research. So I've had a problem in my life. I've actually gone through my, my center, which I sent, which I developed is 20 years old this year. And 78% of my staff have been women over the time. So I've got a gender balance problem in the reverse direction. Um, probably because, and I hate to say this, but probably because most of those 78% were quite young, early in their career type women. And we know that as, as you know, we get older and things, men tend to dominate the field a little bit more than females in terms of older age groups. So, so this was a retreat photo of the Blue Mountains and you can see that there's no Y chromosome in sight there. Um, so very important, I, I wrote a paper on this in 2015 and I used the term why mentoring as, a, as an alternative to mentoring uh, to highlight the fact that women need, we all need mentoring. I still have my own mentors today. We all need mentors, but I think women especially need mentors because of the extra barriers that they have. If you're still not sure, of course, again, you ask the queen um, and she knows all too well the issues with females being dominated in relationships and all that sort of stuff. Um, she's had a lot of relationships, hasn't she? It's got to start thinking about her. Okay, number eight, if you're going overseas, go to the best. So when you go do a postdoc, if you do do it overseas, try and pick, think in your imagination, what is the best place for my field? You know, zebrafish in cardiovascular disease, where should I go, which is the best in the world, and go there. Because that, that event, whether it's a year's stay, three years stay, whatever it is, it's gonna be on your CV for the rest of your life. And I have to say, it's always impressive when you look and someone's been to Harvard for three years or Oxford for three years or whatever. Um, so little things like that, I mean, the big things in terms of life, life changing things, but um, a real opportunities to go to the best and, and then you learn from the best. And so you come back to Australia and you try and adopt some of those things that you've learned over time from the best in the world. So don't be shy. If you're shy about approaching someone at Harvard Medical School, ask the Jamie Vandenbergs, ask the Bob Grahams, ask the people who have already known these people to, to give you a leverage into the, 
into the into the institution. Okay, don't forget community media and discipline. This is always coming up in applications and mentors should be telling you that you don't just sit at the bench and do your wet work or your public health work or clinical studies. You've got to do other things. Um, here are some things I've done in the past. I've spent some time in Cambodia um, for a week at a time in the villages to look for rheumatic heart disease. Best times ever. Uh, I, learned, I never lived in somewhere where there's no electricity and no clean water. Um, but it was so rewarding and something that I'm really proud of what we did. Um, I did do something stupid, which was try to raise money for a 10 kilometer run down the bottom right there. And I said, if they raise, if I raise $10,000, I'll run in a pink tutu. And I, they raised ten and a half thousand dollars So I couldn't find a pink tutu. So I got a nice lime green one and ran 10 kilometers in that. So community fund runs, that sort of thing, all good. Take up all media opportunities. Don't be shy. If there's an media opportunity, TV, um radio whatever it might be social media there's a lot of uh exposure as well take those opportunities because they're very important in terms of showing the impact of your research into the community and finally support your institution i mean my institution is university of sydney centenary institute and royal prince alfred hospital they're my three home bases and i do my best to support the institutes so i, I assess phd uh, candidates and uh, give talks and lectures to the students and that sort of thing. Do all those sort of things because they're important things to build the next generation. And it shows your maturity and your knowledge in the field that you can give a talk to students about these things. And finally, 10, never give up. Um, you, some people will give up eventually, and it's not a bad thing, but I have to show you my other love. I mean, sorry, Taylor Swift is not my love, but my, my other passion is uh, the Rabbitohs. The Rabbitohs is a rugby league team in Sydney. Um, and you don't have to know about anything about rugby league, but you need to know the story. A foundation club from 1908 had been in a competition all that time, got kicked out of the competition, unheard of, in 1999 by the big end of town, the Murdochs and things, because we didn't have the right budget to continue competing. Out of the competition for three years, went to the highest court in the land, won the case, and came back into the competition. However, by then they'd lost all their players. So they came last for the first next three years. But on October the 5th, 2014, at Olympic Stadium in Homebush, they won the premiership. And so that's a, to me, that's a rags to riches story. And I love those sort of stories. But uh, it, it should, you know, at you know, some level spur you want to, you know, doing the best you can. You know, when things are tough, try not to give up. And uh, often persistence pays off. Um, so the final thing I'll say, I think I'm a little bit over 10 minutes, but I apologize. So I'll, I'll we'll click the questions shorter if you want. Um, but I like this quote. I don't know who, whose quote it is. Great mentors push you to the edges. They make you realize that you could do things you'd never dreamt of. And why do I show mice? I work with mice for 10 years. And if anyone's worked with mice, if you push them to the edge of a, a surface, they will never go to the next surface unless they can feel it. They won't jump unless you throw them off the bench. So they'll always put their paws out and feel for the next level and they'll move to the next level. In, in mentorship, I think sometimes we have to push people off. We have to, to be a good mentor, sometimes we have to say, yeah, we take the small steps, but how about we go a big step and go for the international prominence sort of perspective. So I think mentorship is a bit like that. It might seem cruel sometimes, but somebody has to push the young researchers and early career researchers to go to the next step. And, and the benefit that the mentor has is that they've got the big picture, uh, which you often don't see as an ECR or an PMCR. And so in my final slide, it's 2022, um, big picture ahead. I think there's a lot of promising things happening this year. I think things are going to go much better this year. I've got good, good vibes. Um, we're going to have a good session in a, in a few minutes time to discuss COVID and, and whatnot. Um, and uh, I conclude my talk by saying, you know, we, we all really value the ECRs and the MCRs. Um, I was part of that group that, that met with the government for two years to finally get the $150 million over 10 years, which was a fantastic thing. And a lot of people have been beneficiaries. And a cornerstone of that funding was the EMCRs. You know, the government sees it that way. The, the, the big bosses in the institutions think it that way. You guys are the future of the place. And so be proud of who you are and get a good mentor. And if you don't get a good mentor, keep looking. Thank you very much.
happy to take a question or two if people want to, or we can go straight to the panel. Um, any questions? Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Mentor, sponsor, coach. I, I'm not much into definitions, to be honest. I, I value somebody who's going to help you to advance their career. I think a mentor can potentially be by all, all three. But, I mean, you what you want from the mentor is support and guidance about your career. I mean, that's the simplest definition of what a mentor should be. Sponsors and those sort of things, coaches, I, I get confused. I did the Franklin Women's Program last year, which is just, for the people out there in, in Zoom land, the Frank, Franklin Women Program, fantastic. I'm um, just hoping Mel, Mel is looking and, um, and, and they talked about those different breakdowns and, um, but I, I think a mentor is basically somebody who's gonna guide you through your career. And you, I have mentors today. So I'm an old man, but I've still got people that I turn to every six months and have a chat to about various things. Because, you know, you have career changes when you're 56, as I am. So you can never not have a mentor. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Yep. I'm Audrey Aji from the Victor Chang. Just question, how important do you think is that we have mentors from different areas of our research, not just focus on one? Sorry, so repeat the question. How important is it you, you think that we have mentors from different areas of research? Yes, absolutely. I, I totally agree that, you know, there are mentors that will help you guide your experiments and you know, the, the specifics, but that's sort of your boss. That's sort of your supervisor. You want a mentor. I mean, there's an argument whether the mentor should be someone close to you or a bit distant to you. And I think both work. You know, I'm a mentor for people in public health, in breast cancer oncology, um, a few other sort of left field sort of areas, because sometimes it's better to get an outside opinion about your career progression than someone inside, this, inside your field. And they're a bit more objective as well. They're probably less conflicted. So I, I'm all for, you know, it doesn't have to match up. If you're Victor Chang and you're doing basic science biology, you have to have a mentor that's Bob Graham. Yeah, he was my PhD supervisor, so I'm always, till today, I'm scared of him. Um, but you, I think getting a different opinion is very important for your career development. Yes. Yeah. Your mentor, if you're a PhD student, might be best then not from your supervisory team at all, or from your institute? The supervisory team can play a role as a mentor, but you have to be careful that your primary PhD supervisor may have different um, objectives that you have. So you, he might think that you're brilliant and he'll basically say, or he or she will say, stay with us for the next 10 years. I'm being, I'm exaggerating. But a non-biased mentor will say, hey, you've just completed a great PhD, go to Oxford or Cambridge or, or Harvard and, and you know, or go to a different institution or something. So you've got to be careful um, that your PhD supervisor, for example, will give you mentoring advice, but it's always not, it's not offensive to go to somebody else and get further advice. You can have five mentors, that's fine. Um, so I'd be just a little bit wary of ulterior motives sometimes with PhD supervisors. I've seen it work really positively as mentor and I've seen it work really terribly as well. Any other questions? I mean, people on, online are missing the beautiful weather we're having. It's just, <laughs> uh, it's sunny here in Sydney. It's fantastic. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, so, yep, yep. Uh, it's Peter here from UTS. I'm just wondering, is it like a very important or tricky to have a mentor with different gender? Mentor of different gender? Yeah, that's, that always comes up as well. Um, I, I don't have a firm view. I think a male can be a mentor for a female. I, I'd say most of my mentees are female, 80%. Um, I think the, the woman can be the mentor, the male can be the, 
mentee. Um, the argument that is proposed that a woman, and I mean this sincerely, will understand the needs of a mentee who's female as well, because of the similar barriers that they may have. But I argue that you know there's there are some women who would be great at doing that, but there are some men that would be great at doing that as well. Um, so I, I personally, I'd be interested in other people's thoughts. I don't think a male should have a male mentor or a female should have a female mentor. But I think that, as I said to the gentleman before, you, know, you can have a couple of mentors. You can have a male mentor and a female mentor. That's, that's fine. You'll get, you'll get different perspectives from each and, and hopefully that'll help you grow better. But, but I don't think a male should be a male, female should be a female. It's my personal view. Yes. Hi, I'm Clara from University of Sydney. How important is it um, that they're a lot more senior to you rather than say a younger mentor has more fresh ideas? Yeah, that, that, I mean, the, the photo I showed on the second slide was an old man as the mentor in Greek, Greek uh, history. Um, again, I think you can benefit from both, but my general comment is that you want somebody who's got a bit of wisdom. I don't know what that word really means, wisdom, but somebody who's been, <laughs> You know what I mean? Like he's been through a bit, has, has mentored other students and other PhDs and other uh, early postdocs. So you, you do want someone with some grey hair and no hair and that sort of thing, um, just, just for the wisdom side of things. I mean, the younger mentor, mentee, I mean, it might be the sort of person that you might have a coffee with once every six months and run your research by them and see what they think sort of thing. But that's where it overlaps into more a collaborative project. So I'm not ageist in any way. I think you get benefits from both, but generally I think someone with a bit of wisdom might know the past a bit better. Yes. Yeah, go for it. I guess like a, a lot of things are different now. And so is there, yeah, maybe a benefit you say two mentors having one who does have the wisdom, but it's one who is, just gone through what you've gone through in yeah. terms of you know the new grants the new um things with promotion in terms of governance it's like it's all a little bit different totally now. totally so what you're you're alluding to is that the one who's older and wiser and more wisdom also doesn't know the system very well now because they've been out of the system for a while which is true so we i mean i'll give you an example we buddy up in our group so jess orchard who's a fantastic early career researcher heart foundation fellow is helping my PhD student who's just in her final year in terms of guiding her into the last, last steps of the PhD. So, you know, I would call that a, a mentoring or a buddying role. And I, I think it's, you're right, you're 100% right. You can't get enough advice from people. I mean, if I'm stuck with anything, I always ask, I call people. I know people pick up a phone and call people, you know, message them on Instagram or TikTok or something like that. So I, I agree. So if we can start by, I'll ask each of the four speakers to briefly introduce themselves, um, starting with um, Monique. Hi, uh, I'm Monique Francois. I'm from the University of Wollongong and I'm a researcher in diabetes and cardiovascular disease, as well as gestational diabetes. And my work involves human face-to-face -face clinical trials, where we bring patients into the clinical trials unit and measure their vascular function and glucose control. And I'm a lecturer, at, I guess, at the University of Wollongong. Fantastic, thank you. Faraz? Hi, I'm Faraz Batan. I'm a clinician scientist at Nepean Hospital in Sydney University. Um, my research focus is on a few aspects, but cardiovascular imaging being one, obesity being probably my second area and how that interacts with imaging. Um, and but probably my passion project is looking at workplace health interventions to get our staff healthier. Emily? Hi, I'm Emily Wong. I am faculty and uh, head of regulatory systems lab at the Victor Chang Cardiac Research Institute. Uh, we do, I'm interested in the heart regulatory network and we use uh, genomic approaches and also a lot of computational approaches to do what we do. Thanks. Um, I'm Alexandra Jones or Ali. I'm at the George Institute for Global Health and I'm a public health lawyer. So my work is really about food regulation and how it can be used to promote healthier diets. 
Um, I work with people who crunch numbers for me to assess whether policies are being implemented properly or the benefits from policies like sugar taxes or food labeling. Um, that's, yeah, that's probably it. Fantastic, yep. great. So you've heard their backgrounds and start thinking about some questions, but I'm gonna ask two questions to start with, simple questions. First question, I'm gonna start in reverse in the sense that what's been a positive thing that's come out of the COVID pandemic? Positive for your research, for your life? Anyone can start. I think um, because I work in public health law, I think nobody now doubts what that's about. <laughs> um, which, you know, before we had to sort of justify who we were and why we had a role. And now every day there's a new public health order and people understand how that shapes their lives or also the need for government intervention to protect public health. So I think that's actually been a really um, big benefit in my field. Um, I'm happy to go. I. Two things that have really come out is one is you know I, every few years i have a crisis am i doing the right thing with my life and um having not being able to do research not having patients in not um attending conferences was really eye-opening i thought i really miss this and i want us to get back to normal so i think it's an important realization about finding your place by losing the opportunity to some extent um, I think the second thing is the opposite is that, you know, sometimes you've got the next grant to write or the paper to write and I've got social functions and my wife's like, we've got to go to this dinner. And I was like, oh, that's an opportunity cost. I could really nut out something in this time. And <laughs> you realize though that those are the things that give you your energy. And I, I think for the last two years, my motivation's really tanked because those are the things that charge up your battery. And so realizing that, you know, we can love research, but at the end of the day, that's not necessarily where you charge your battery. And I think that realization is important. So it's given a sense of perspective, a sense of balance that, you know, going out there and not doing research for a while is gonna make me a better researcher rather than just drumming out that next grant application paper. The only thing that I would say has come out of it for my research team is, um, so I'm a young mum, and so I wouldn't otherwise be able to go to international conferences at the moment with young, uh, kids so it has given me the opportunity to still um, be an invited speaker and be able to do that at 1am in the morning but you know you can still put it on your CV that you were able to attend I guess is one positive out of it for me. Yeah uh, if I could add just a point there the ESC which is the European Society of Cardiology meeting last year normally has 30,000 people attending had over 100,000 registrants from over 200 countries which has never happened before so so there has been opportunities for people in poorer countries to attend these meetings as well. They made registration free. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great positive. Emily? Um, for me, I, well, I, found, I found it really challenging in general. Um, in terms of positives, perhaps having the time to reflect a bit um, and, and to be a bit more philosophical maybe about uh, research. <laughs> struggling to find positives <laughs> all right um you all come from different fields in terms of your research public health basic science clinical clinical what's been the biggest the worst impact of COVID on your research what, what's been the most damaging part of your impact maybe emily can go first because i think she had a, a major impact I, I think it's just the uncertainty which i think was alluded to in the in the questions, guiding questions, I think, just not knowing what's going to happen next and not knowing how to plan ahead. Um, and maybe just dealing with whether you're there for your team as well, because um, we don't see each other face to face. So I think just, yeah, the uncertainty. Um, the most damaging thing would be delays. Yeah, so probably a good year behind. Like we were able to adapt, but things have been, I forget my student phone now, things have been, yeah, very slow and delayed. In terms of your research, in terms of writing papers, in terms of grant, you know, what particularly? Uh, or, or, data or, or, collection. Yeah. So in terms of finishing clinical trials, meeting grant deadlines, yeah. PhD students being able to finish, um, yeah, no time to write papers with children at home. Yeah. 
friends? Look, I would echo that. I, I mean, the last two years, I, I'm thinking positively, it's the first two sets of Federer versus Medvedev, sorry, Nadal, Medvedev, right? I mean, we've got our ass kicked, but we need to sort of hang in there. Uh, everything's being delayed. Um, hospitals shut down for our patient services. It's going to be very hard to bring research participants in. And I think it's been across three stratas. I mean, if you took it, look at PhD students, not just mine, but other students have their whole plan and experiments delayed. Um, at early career research levels, either, you know, you haven't got grants and you're struggling to hand in there, or I've been lucky to get a grant and uh, I'm embarrassed that I might not be able to deliver in a certain timeline. And I think a forum such as this to articulate the voices to say, you know, perhaps whether it's the CVRN or the Heart Foundation, reach out to all academics and investigators and to say, what can we do? Because the last two years have been, you know, unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And because I, I, I do believe if we hang in there, we'll, we'll win the tournament, but um, it, it will require a collaborative effort, so to speak, yeah. I think for me, working in public health policy, um, it's been getting political or public interest in our work in a COVID environment when the media just want to talk about COVID every day. Um, and, you know, we get a lot of, um, I get a lot of my energy and motivation from speaking to the media or speaking with um, people in government to try and shift policy. And when everyone in the Ministry of Health is diverted to working on COVID, but still the majority of us are dying from chronic non-communicable diseases, it's really hard to have those conversations and say like, please, we still want to talk about the food environment and, and those kinds of things. So um, in terms of staying engaged, it's been hard to hang in there. I know our comms team have been really sad over the past couple of years trying to get any stories out there. Very good. All right, these guys are open for questions, comments. Um, I'd like to keep it pretty positive. So looking at the year ahead, how are we going to do this? How are we all going to get back together? I mean, this event today is fantastic that we can actually sit and chat, not in a box. Yes, go for it. Oh yeah, microphone? Can't sound. You mentioned about a PhD students and I, I agree with you. I, I sit on HDR panels as well and the the motivation is very low and it's been very difficult for PhD students so how would you suggest that we uh, motivate our PhD students to sort of get through get across the line for the, for the last year or two that they have and the fact that they've missed probably a year's worth of experimental work due to lockdowns um look a couple of things I, i've got a couple of students i think the simple thing is checking on them do do it from a social point of view not just an academic point of view but perhaps more than that going to the core fundamentals of a phd i've got invested biases to publish a bunch of papers and deliver on grants but a phd is a learning degree and to emphasize that to the students that you know they may not hit certain benchmarks but as long as they have learned or along the way to redesign those projects so that they can reach their outputs uh, you know i think is taking the role of a phd teacher rather than just an investigator i think that's really important for our students um because i think sometimes they get lost in our the bigger games we're sort of playing rather than um what their objectives are from their phd and i would say that the success of a phd is for me to train uh, i've got four students at the moment absolute killers who go out there and smash it and and that should be our objective so you know take on the role as a coach and a mentor and i think if you can dial up that motivation you get a return on investment because motivated happier people just do a damn good job um I, i'm not saying it's easy um it's challenging things come along in the way that really muck it up and i'm you know I, let's not hope for another variant but working on that um and, and then the social dimension I, I i think it is really really important that so much of work is about meeting people bouncing off that positive energy and we've been missing that because i just don't think you can replicate that online so uh you know we're having a meeting of at Nepean Hospital of all the post-grad students, some coffee and cake, and got a bit of a budget to go out, take everyone out for a dinner. Uh, I think those things are really important investments and uh, I think they pay off in spades. Yeah. Other comments from the panel? I think it's about us being able to adapt. So putting a plan in place, learning systematic literature reviews, 
hosting home-based clinical trials using the post um i think it's yeah it's really up to us to keep that motivation going and make our online meetings fun or return to work yeah john oh, uh, i have a question for ali um it's a question i've I've argued with myself about how to deal with it. Uh, Anti-vaxxers. Now, I used to think they were plain and stupid. There are the facts. How do you not understand it? I discovered actually quite a few anti-vaxxers who were definitely intelligent. Definitely intelligent. And I sort of get stuck. How can you be both? Uh, um, and, and that's a very negative view. And, and approaching people with a negative view is not the way to get an answer for them or for you either. So how do you do it? It's a big question for me, asking how to do the kind of comms with them. I think it's been really interesting to watch our society struggle with that from a public health messaging perspective. I think that the offering people a carrot to participate back in society seemed to work. Um, so, you know, that knocked some people out of their stubbornness because they realised they could no longer participate. It was interesting when we set the goal and we said, well, no, we're going to meet 90% and I feel like we removed that um, incentive so people, the sticklers could stay there. But I, I tend not to try and engage too much with some of these people because there's always some people in the middle that can move and then there are people that you're never going to win. Um, I definitely steer clear of them on Twitter. <laughs> Relative. I, I think I really look to people like Julie Leask from the university here who has written great conversation articles on how to like deal with your relatives when you're talking about vaccine hesitancy. Don't give up on your family, Chris. <laughs> yes. Hi, um, I'm Amy from Bob's Lab. Um, I was just going to ask, um, going back to the positive theme for EMCRs of what was the most kind of important or significant step do you think in your early career that led you to become lab heads today? What do you think was like the biggest turning point, I guess? Going overseas. I have a PhD and postdoc overseas and I went to North America. It was a great experience and great for the CV. Um, for me, I, I probably a bit more complicated because I never wanted to be a researcher. I was a clinician and I did the PhD as a stepping stone to get a boss job and accidentally just fell in love with the whole process. And now I'm trying to be much less a clinician and much more a researcher. So um, I don't think it was one step, but I, I do think it's the environment. So I was at the Menzies Institute in Tasmania and it was just such a cool, fun place to be you discuss ideas and, and that's very rare in medicine is it's a profoundly uncreative exercise because you don't want your doctor coming up with creative solutions, so to speak. Um, it was creativity. Um, it was constrained creativity, but that's what it was. And I fell in love with the process. So, um, and it's something I'm really hoping to replicate at my hospital because we don't have an institute is create that seductive um, environment where people are going to be wooed towards academia. Yeah. So I think for me, it was just doing what you love. And I, I fell in love with doing bioinformatics and it just carried me on from there. And then I, along the way, I had really good mentors. Um, I got to go overseas. I took that opportunity. But just all, always along the way, just doing what you really are passionate about and, and you become good at it, I think. So, yeah. I think being intentional about who I work with and picking people that came as really recommended to work with. So the first position I took at the George was definitely not my dream job. It was a, a pay cut from where I was before. I didn't have a PhD at that point. I was just interested in public health, but in when working in a different area. Um, but I knew that people said Bruce Neal was really good to work for. And over time, I created a position that I liked and ended up doing a PhD there with, with that team. And I feel like um, being surrounded by them now, they're all well-funded as well. So this is a buffer for this period of uncertainty, really, when you work with good people that you like working with. They like you. They're well-funded. That's also a buffer for you as an EMCR. So, you know, I don't know. It sounds a bit, it's not mercenary, but I think it, it is strategic. And if you like working with them, then all the better. 
So Ali, can I extend you a little bit there and just ask, you know, do you think it's good for pay people to do their PhD and then continue in the same environment or do what? what no, uh, yeah, I think my experience is probably a bit different to most because I started my PhD late and I'd already spent three years in DC before I came. And so a lot of the collaborations I have from Georgetown Law, I kept an hour. But when I finished, I was at an age where I was like, I, I don't want to go live overseas again. I actually, for my personal life, want to reconnect with my family and, and get a partner here. So each PhD is so different when people come to it at different points in their life. But definitely my prior to PhD overseas experience is a key reason why I have yeah. the grants I have now. Great answer. Question, yes. Sorry, um, you and then Zoe. Oh, is that all right? You Sorry. Go um, I guess back to COVID and shifting yeah. to the virtual environment, I actually found that I reached out a lot more to people internationally. Um, I guess with everyone was in the same boat. Um, and I think the virtual environment really facilitated that. Did you guys tend to stick to your team or did you find that you branched out a little bit more? I've been playing a game of aggressively using technology because I learned how to use Twitter last year as part of a, um, there was a program by the Australian Cardiovascular Alliance and it was a phenomenal program. So um, reaching out to people through Twitter, which led to some interesting connections, also using LinkedIn and I've managed to get um, myself somehow into a startup space that I don't know how it happened and 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 it was these messages and I'd say look we're interested you know looking at body surface area and people were building these 3D suits which could then size you and we're now collaborating and mm, doing this for echo machines and stuff so I mean most of these people don't respond to you but I, I think Twitter is an incredibly powerful tool um, incredibly dangerous sometimes as well but incredibly powerful tool but I think using networking and I, I I do think that one of the real benefits of COVID is the fundamental nature of work will change um, I, I you know I think we're going to be having meetings and you know offices in the metaverse at some stage and we'll have labs and physical tangible assets we need to return to and I think we should all embrace that, connect with people. But the only problem is I spend half an hour looking at a Twitter feed this every morning now, rather than <laughs> getting up and going for a run. So I guess for me, um, in, in my field, I think in our, my research, a lot of the most exciting papers I find come out from just going through my Twitter feed. Um, but in terms of just going and, I mean, there's lots of online seminars everywhere, but because of the time zone differences, I just, I can't, I can't attend. <laughs> I tried to wake up in the middle of the night and attend some of those, but it's really hard to connect. Um, so, so I think there's benefits, um, but that it's also very difficult to connect to those international meetings. Yeah, I think a good example for me is that I host a node at the Charles Perkins Centre on Food Governance and we had an, a domestic conference before and we were approached by partners in the US to do an international conference with them and I don't think we ever would have done it in a normal year where we would have been doing on-site things but we decided to do an online virtual conference and it meant that we got our audiences from both places. Um, they also gave us a bunch of funding. Um, so I think, you know, making the most of, of opportunities like that has been good. I mean, looking on Twitter, there's been a lot of people who've been invited to grand rounds and things like that in Stanford and New York and all these sort of places, which they'd, they'd honestly never get an invite if it was to be flown over there. So there are opportunities opening up all the time. Zoe? Yeah, um, Faraz, I think that you just briefly touched on this in the previous question about the way we work is going to change. And I, I mean, we kind of talk about a lot, you know, when things go back to normal, when it's normal again, do you think um, for all of you, are there any parts of the EMCR experience that are going to be permanently changed um, and that it's going to be different forever now going forward for EMCRs? I think online meetings show that it can work. Uh, there was a really interesting article saying that uh, I think with the nature of work changing, you know, there's two bands. The people saying that remote work is ineffective and lose productivity and others saying we get increased productivity. And I think we're seeing a bifurcation. People who enjoy the work are profoundly productive at home. And I think this means employers 
supervisors need to cultivate a work environment where people are motivated and driven. And so I don't want everything to change. I think it's really nice that um, students of mine who have families can join in online to a meeting and still look after their kids. Uh, I don't think we physically need to come into work and it fundamentally changes the fact whether we, we need to live in the city if you're only coming into work two days a week. Um, so, so I think some of these things will change. I, I genuinely think institutes, universities that have a strategic working from home plan of how to modulate this are going to succeed. And the ones that don't, you know, we're facing the great resignation. We have incredibly smart, motivated people who could be paid a lot more money when these jobs come up because they can handle data, they're, they're you know, creative and intelligent. Let's compete for that intellectual capital and let's strategize for it. Yeah, comments? Yeah, I think, I think at the George, um, I've seen changes, I would say before, we would have had some people who might be overseas, but sort of performing work for us. But now that's like, we're so much more willing to, you know, hire PhD students who are in other Australian cities and like, oh, they'll just come here every few months for something, you know. And so that also opens opportunities, potentially, if you've got a couple of days work somewhere, but you can pick up a couple of days on, you know, in another jurisdiction or things like that. So I think there are some pretty cool opportunities for that. What about the bigger picture of international meetings? I mean, we want to go down a path of, you know, carbon footprints and things like that. You know, we travel across the world to give a 15 minute talk. And I know there's other things associated with that. You interact with people and that sort of thing. But do you think that, it's going on Zoe's question, do you think that's going to change as well, where the international meetings might be less face-to-face -face and more hybrid or combination? Yeah, I can't say if they're not, but I, I don't know how many of us attended a meeting and also answered emails in the background or went to the small talk that we wanted to not listen to other talks, but we probably would have found interesting, but we weren't in the room or, yeah, I don't know. That's the only thing that I worry about is missing out on things yeah. by having it online. And I think it especially affects EMCRs because you want to make those networks, make those connections. And it's really hard when you, when you can't, yeah, when you can't speak to people, can't meet people. Yeah. Also the buzz. Uh, I, I really enjoy the meetings for the social side, the buzz. Um, and, and I think that's missing, but you know, there's a way, you know, when the soccer World Cup's happening and you've got like the Australian crowd in Sydney somewhere at a crown casino, there's no reason we can't have chapters for meetings. So you have, EC, uh, you know, ESC happening and, you know, and I, and I think it'd be really fun. So we sort of capture the buzz and the chemistry within our local group, um, but also I've got an 18 month old son. So I didn't really want to go overseas and not spend time with him basically. So I really enjoyed the fact I could, you know, be in my shorts and, you know, um, give a presentation and then um, get vomited on. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, other question, yes. That sort of comes to my question. What is the thing you've learned during the last 12 months in terms of work-life balance that you're keen to take forward? I think I was working too much in 2020. Like I burrowed in at home and, and, and realized I couldn't sustain that kind of work. Um, Frankly, I've made a pretty big decision in the past 12 months, which was definitely influenced by COVID. And that's that um, I wasn't happy with my work-life balance, but I didn't have a partner and I decided to have a kid on my own. So I'm pregnant at the moment. And um, I think that part of the reason behind that was that I've got a fellowship and I was like, this is probably the most security I'm ever going to have in my working career. Um, and because I'm a medical researcher, I read the evidence of declining fertility in women at a certain <laughs> age. And I was like, Shh, I need to do this. And, and, and COVID has impacted my ability to socially be out meeting partners. So it sort of shows up in all the elements of your life. I think I went really hard on work in 2020. And then at some point I was like, I need to shift this balance. And what am I going to actively do to shift that balance? I told you this panel was going to be riveting. <laughs> Congratulations on behalf of everyone. Congratulations. Other comments? Um, look, I, I, I see myself working very hard to do as little work as possible, so to speak. 
um, I'd like to get a bit more of a work-life balance. And it's really hard striking that as an academic because you're in a hyper-competitive environment. But, you know, I, I do think it's bad perspective because at some stage I'm going to be dead and there's not going to be the number of papers I've published or my H index on, uh, on my grave. Yard. So I want to I want to spend time with my family, and uh, I mean, if I have one super hardcore ten year objective, it's to get half a day where I can pick my son up from school, you know, and get some pasta and make a meal, and you know, just do something different that's got nothing to do with work at all, and that energizes me to use my career and pivot into that and use that as a leverage to be able to achieve that goal. I don't know if it'll happen, you know. No. Yeah, I guess I can say it because my boss is in here. But I did, um, <laughs> during the lockdown, I did pull Olivia out of daycare. Um, and so I worked four days. But, you know, we all work more than four days anyway. So I was accepted about to get one. Yeah. Uh, um, other questions? Yes. Oh, sorry. Did you... Oh, no, no. That's... Well, I, I was just going to say A it. follow up question? <laughs> okay, and then follow on. And then... Yeah, I was just going to say, um, yeah, and I, I don't think I've got the solution for work life balance, but I think you just learn to, you know, you, you learn to live with it and you also learn to sacrifice a lot. I think um, I've got two kids, so there's a, always a little bit of mother's guilt, but I, I don't have the, the solution, but I think you just have to be kind to yourself at some stage. Yeah. Do you have a follow-up? Normalising normalizing part-time work. Normalising part-time work. Comment? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's important. I, 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 I do think that we're seeing a generational shift. You know, I go back to soccer and there was a generation where Alex Ferguson would throw a shoe at David Beckham and everyone would fall into line and it's just not happening. We've, we've got a different generation and I think we're after different things and meaning and purpose. And, and, and I do think that this is gonna to come to affect all of us. I, I think it's something reasonable. And if you plan for it, you can get the same output um, and you're gonna keep people in the workforce who are motivated and driven. As in, the other point I was gonna say that's really nice is when you try to work, having a kid made me, I was always vulnerable about not being disagreeable enough because your training's about saying yes to everything. And I've become so disagreeable, it's fantastic because I just say no. And, and, and I think part of leadership is being able to say no. It's being able to deep, disinvest from low value assets and realign your priorities. So I, I think whether it's life, a work-life balance or family, it, it, I think it teaches you to become a leader because it gets you to say no when you don't want to, when every fiber in your being says, oh, just say yes, it'll be easier. So I think that's a place. I think it should be normalized, but I also think we should pay people for their outputs. So my concern is that everyone says they're gonna work four days and get paid a four day wage, but really still have to produce the same. Um, and you know, there's quite a lot of good evidence now from pilot studies in other countries with four day working weeks where the people are just as productive and they're also happier because they have that time that day with their kids or whatever. Um, so I think there's like a bigger structural shift that I'd like to see where I do know someone at the university here who actually, she said her part time um, contract or something after maternity leave finished and her boss didn't notice but then when he finally did notice he was like well you've been producing enough anyway so I'm quite happy with the fact that we've been paying you for five days a week and you ha you've been having that day with your daughter because you know we you're just as productive as any of the people who are here for five days so the more I think COVID has created opportunities where we know people might not be working at the times we expected them from nine to five because they might have other life things to do but generally they still will get their things done. And I think it'd be good if we valued that. I think we should call it life work balance. It's really integrating work into your life. Um, around. Okay, question. Yep, um, Michael from Sydney here. And um, so Chris mentioned something initially that, that publication is the currency. And do you think that during COVID time, you know, there's a cryptocurrency equivalent in uh, in research and in terms of, I guess, in terms of grants, in terms of how you measure up against other uh, applicants. I guess um, earlier on uh, mentioned about Twitter, and I think that's a very good way to also justify your impact and things like that. Is, are there anything else that you think you know, this 
COVID rule has changed us in terms of how to justify our, our, our impact, our, our currency, our worth. So I'm not sure about the NHMRC, but I think for the ARC, they have extended the time for like the early career fellowships for one year, like regardless. Um, so you don't have to justify that. So everyone gets an additional year. Um, I think it's, I mean, it's so hard. I think people try to take that into account, but at the end of the day, especially if you're early career, you need to have those publications. If people wanna help you, but you still need to have something. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard because it's so competitive. Um, I don't know if it's more positive spin on this. <laughs> I mean, I know yeah. some people during the COVID time wrote more editorials and wrote more, review yeah, more reviews, systematic reviews and analysed data that they hadn't analysed that was sitting in the back of the drawer sort of thing. But I don't know retrospectively what you could do to, we're being positive today, we're moving forward, but retrospectively, I think things like adjustments to, you know, how many years postdoc are things that are important. I don't know of any other things. I don't know if the other panel members have any. I guess the only one is that the NHMRC has moved to your top, is it top five or top 10 top publications? 10 10. So then maybe not the number, you don't have to worry about the number so much. You just yeah. try to get the impact of those papers out. And that's, yeah, I think that's what's going to be most important is getting that one paper up to the top. Yeah. And I, I think if you're doing a PhD, it's worth extending it because when, once you, um, complete and once you submit that's when your years start counting so um, it's worth getting as many papers as you can before you submit i, I just want to uh, echo emily's point because as soon as it's post phd you're judged relative to your phd completion date so extending it at the moment is a really important strategic move um, in order to be able to do it. I, I, you know, there are systematic reviews you can do or editorials and things like that. The other thing you can do is, I mean, uh, even now, I just run blindly in a direction and run really, really hard and then realize I've gone in the wrong direction. Um, and part of this is slowing down and thinking, you know, sort of the measure, measure twice, cut once approach. So using that time to think and strategize rather than coming up with a grand idea and just running you know i i think that's important but I, I think probably the most useful thing is extending the phd um finding a way to do it and then or even going part-time uh, getting some work on the side because that's you know we've got to recognize realities on the ground that stipends might run out and whatnot but that way when you get your award that's when you end up competing although <laughs> we are often judged on completions. So if you've moved up to that level, I guess like, yeah, you start to more think about your students completing within the time frame. and universities have, we've got, I don't know, at UAW, we've been cut from 3.5 years to three years and they oh, are wow. pushing completions. Oh, wow. And yeah, so wow. it, yeah, as an EMCR, <laughs> delaying it is good, but as a supervisor, it, yeah, it becomes a tricky balance, doesn't it? Nothing is easy, is it? Question from the gentleman. Thank you. Uh, Angelo from Western Sydney Uni. Um, Dr. Pathan, you were saying that it's important to be more disagreeable, but as an early career researcher, you have to balance that with the FOMO you have of missing out. And as you all articulated well, you have a certain amount of time to produce your output post PhD. So how do you manage FOMO and how do you, what would you recommend for early career researchers in picking which uh, tasks or projects would uh, best contribute to their track record? How, how would you guide them in that, that path? That, that's tough, right? I used to collect projects like Pokemon, you know, it, 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 it was too many. I wanted to have them all. I think exactly. Chris's point here is about mentorship, right? It's about creating a matrix of what your responsibilities are, including papers, projects, grants, roles as a reviewer, and, and then going to senior mentors who are going to be able to say, look, if I was in your position, I would say yes to this, 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 and this. This sounds nice, but, you know, it's a bit of a beat up. It's not worth your time. Uh, I think uh, I, I don't often have the answer. And the problem is, depending on which mentor you go to, some of them will say, well, I work 100 hours a week and I would do all of those. And that's not necessarily the answer you need sometimes. 
Um, so I think it is prioritizing them, looking at what is going to give you the yield. So almost iterate this game forward that you, and I think we're always under the illusion we can do everything. And then we end up doing everything not so well, not as expediently as to prioritize the bigger papers, the bigger grants, um, but also the more realistic ones sometimes. You know, there's no point me applying for a big ideas grant because I'm not going to get it at the moment. So focusing on things that are tangible. And there, I think mentorship is so valuable, is finding the people with the experience, with, with the wisdom to say, look, on this payoff matrix, so to speak, these are the ones that you really need to focus on. And these are the ones you should say no to. Yeah, I think it depends on your goal. Is it fellowship or is it 40, 40, 20 job? And mm. they're both very, very different. I think you get better at letting go of the FOMO after a while when you realize there's always more opportunities and actually saying no to some of the, some of them gives you space to say yes to the really good ones when they come along. But I know at the beginning it's hard, but then after a while I'm like, Oh, there's another, you know, small contract for this person, small contract for that one. Now I don't want to get out of bed for more than, <laughs> but that comes with like building up a few well, things. Well, that's the record. thing. I feel like the first three years post PhD, you're just smashing yourself to do as much as you can and juggling all sorts of different projects at the same time hoping you don't drop the ball um and so it's not until you win that first fellowship it's not until you win that investigator grant that you can then be more selective but that's where i find like what uh, dr pathan was saying it's really important to if you have a mentor who can tell you hey this is out of touch you're not going to get it or like you're more likely to succeed in another smaller grant i think that's that was great advice so yeah. and especially uh, like uh, monique also said with um your goal which um Chris, you were saying before, um, it's important to, uh, you know, support your PhD students. But one of the things that, um, that I found is the P PhD students have different goals. So some want to go to industry, some want to be in, in, in research. And so um, one of the things that um, as, a, as a supervisor you'll find is, um, is it your goal or is it the PhD student's goal that you're trying to, to foster, which you kind of touched on earlier? I mean, 100% is the PhD students' goal. I mean, I've had PhD students have gone to do research, gone to do medicine, gone into industry, gone into the pharma, pharmacy industry. Um, you you want to foster their career development. And it comes back to the question we asked before about mentorship and who should be mentor. And you, you want to do the best for the student, is, is my approach. It might not fit in with my plans, because yeah. I'd want that student to stay and publish 100 papers. Yeah. Um, but if, that, if they want to go into industry, you've got to support that yes. and maybe even get people around. I don't know anything about industry, but get people around who can help foster that career development. We've got a question from online. So the people, uh, there are people online and uh, we're all going to go out into the sun in a little while, um, <laughs> have a surf. Uh, Monique, Monique mentioned COVID offered her opportunity to attend conferences she would not normally be able to attend being a parent of young children. Moving forward, post-COVID situation, going back to face-to-face, -to -face, do you think these opportunities will no longer be available? You sort of touched well, on it. I have a great example for that. <laughs> um, so recently I was invited to speak at the American Diabetes Association, which is huge for my career. And prior to answering this email, we hadn't got COVID yet. So I was like still more tempted about traveling overseas. And I replied back and I said, oh, I'm just, I'm not sure if I can make it this year. You know, she's unvaccinated, yada, yada. Can I please do it virtually? And they replied back, oh, I don't think that's going to be an option because we really want our speakers to be face-to-face. -face. Um, but we will let you know in March. So I'm waiting to know so we can follow up on that one. What, what other thing? Do you think meetings will be the hybrid sort of format moving forward? Or? They'll be hybrid, but... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other, we've gone a little bit over time, but I think it's been a useful discussion. So if we can go for another five minutes, if there's any other questions, because um, the weather's so nice outside. We're gonna <laughs> go and get our bathers. Any other questions or comments? Chris, no other family members that are crazy? Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Well, my final question to the panel is, Moving, we're moving ahead, we're moving forward, COVID's gone, there's no son of Omicron, there's no nothing. Um, 
what are you going to do this year that might be a bit different to what you've done in the past due to COVID? Have you reshaped any of your, you know, goals? Have you decided to have face-to-face, -face, you know, breakfast once a week? Have you decided, like, because we've never seen each other for a long time? But what have you done to change the, the landscape of your year ahead in terms of getting over COVID? What are some practical tips? Got three that I wrote down. Yeah, go, go for it. <laughs> Was this a question in the question? I just made that up. Kind of. <laughs> Number one, account for 30 to 50% of dropouts in your research clinical trials. Right. <laughs> Number two, train up your staff in multiple techniques. So if someone is sick, then they can cover the ultrasound. Number three, continue to run remote and local trials simultaneously. So if something does happen, you can quickly flick to plan B without having to go through ethics and so forth. Yeah, very good. I mean, we've done it in medicine, I'm sure, for us also. I mean, I'd never done a telehealth consultation in my life, and I've done 600 in the last year <laughs> because we had to switch over because we couldn't see anything. So that's now available for some of our country patients and remote patients as a service which we never had before COVID. So that's a positive for me that I learned how to use telehealth and, and our patients would appreciate not traveling four hours from Dubbo to, to get their medication changed. Sorry, Fraz. Um, I, I think reflecting what Monique said is actually the ethics amendments for a COVID contingency plan for every trial that we can have, because otherwise that ties you up for you know the next review meeting and whatnot so uh, this whole month i've just been doing ethics amendments for everything um also important if you're doing clinical trials is to contact your hospital covid controller the infection control team and get a contingency plan that is ready to roll if and when covid happens with clear parameters that define who can still continue to come in because they're triple vaxxed and have had a rat test and acquiring rats, so we've bought a whole bunch of rats. That way, um, you know, if this happens again, you've got the rats ready to go and you're not gonna get caught out, basically. Yeah. So I guess for me, we most of our lab is dry lab based, so computational. So it's, the, I guess the effects haven't been as bad as if I was just doing molecular work only. Um, but I think moving forward, I think just taking um, advantage of the breaks in variants and outbreaks and just when there is a, you know, a low point um, in, in COVID, just being able to bring everyone back in as much as possible so that we can just, you know, at least even socially distanced, but be, be together and have that interaction. Um, for me personally, my year is going to look different because I'm only working <laughs> half a year for the first time ever. Um, but I, I think, you know, where I'm focusing the next um, six months is really on a bit like you. We, we were, we've all been working from home at the George because most of our data, I mean, at least in the food policy team, I could easily work from home. Um, but now it's about that re-engaging with the relationships, which I'm especially keen to do before I become invisible again for a while. I think it's like, how do you reconnect and um, get the engagement with the colleagues and the motivation and kind of remind people of what you're interested in, what your passions are, what you'd like to do when you come back so that you can step out and then come back. I'm interested, Emily, that your team is mainly bioinformatics, so they, they can be working in Africa literally and, and still be doing their job. So how do you get them back in if they're doing a job that doesn't require them to be back in? Well, I, I think some people work really well from home and, and that's great, yeah. but I feel like that there is a lot of, you know, connection that happen and being able to give feedback directly. Yeah. I think that it's, that's really important. It helps yeah. the project moving along. So. I think it comes back to the point about having a beer with each other or having a coffee or whatever. Free food. Free food, that's free food, food, food at the alcohol. George. That, that's what our management committees have been yeah. discussing. Yeah. Free healthy food. Yeah, free healthy food. Salt free. Yeah. Um, I think on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank the panel for the wonderful interactions and wisdom. Hand back to Zoe. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you very much to all of our panel members, um, Monique, Baraz, Emily and Ali. That was an excellent discussion, um, really informative.